Happy Tuesday slash Wednesday slash Thursday slash Friday slash whatever day you're listening to this podcast. Oh, yeah. It is Tuesday for us, and you're listening to another week of Coffee Sometimes, the podcast from Valor Coffee founders, Ethan Rivers, Ross Walters, and Riley Westbrook. Present. Uh, this podcast is brought to you by Valor Coffee. Uh, try it. <laughs> yeah, you should try it. Uh, go to our website, valor.coffee, and buy a box of coffee. And yeah, I said Two, box. Three. It comes in a box. And at some point in this program, we'll be dropping a discount code. Let's go. Oh, come on. What are your favorite coffees right now that we have? Just real quick. <whistles> Great whistle. Uh, we talked about it a few weeks ago. Tan lines. Oh, you yeah. got to have it. You got to have that in your rotation. Yeah. Y'all ain't even ready. It's Kenya Nairi Hill Estate. AA washed. Yeah. And Ethiopia Worka Sakaro Natural 50 50 blend. Skirt. It's so juicy. It's so clean. It's amazing. Amazing. I, I still am just a free throw stan. Mm. We dial that thing in on espresso at the Dunwoody Cafe, and it's just. It's chocolatey. It's fruity. Mm. It's 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 forgiving. <laughs> Easy to dial in. Predictable. Oh, yeah. oh, that's yeah. all I can ask for. Uh, Ethan, mm. you can agree. You don't have to be unique. Tan lines a banger. I'll I'll just take one half of tan lines and I'll I'll grab a a box of Kenyan Nairi Hill Estate. Speaking of, we've had this coffee for four five years now yeah um and somehow uh it gets better every year sam does a better job roasting it the the fine folks in kenya do an amazing job taking care of it sending it to us so i'm pleased i'm always really happy and i i engorge myself with this <laughs> dang uh, you, you engorge yourself or you gorge yourself i disgorge myself. all the above baby this was what was this like our fourth coffee we ever sourced when we started? It was early because we had sure. we had free throw, mm-hmm. we had decaf, mm-hmm. we had uh Ethiopia Edito, workers comp, workers was comp. Costa Rica La Pastora. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was light, <clears throat> and then so it was our fifth one. Our fifth was Kenya, Niagara, Hill mm-hmm. State. Good times, good times, yeah. Um. So, spoiler alert, that's the coffee we're sipping on right now. We brewed up a Cheers. half pot of drip. Clink. On the... To the king. Curtis, and it's tasting fantastic. Sometimes drip just hits, you know? I think it hits most of the time for me. You it's guys... My, my favorite. Remember that scene? I'm going to talk about a meme here. I talk about a meme every week. You're the meme guy. You guys remember that scene of The Office where Dwight is sitting by the dumpster playing the flute? Or the recorder. Yep. Uh, there's a meme going around about that. And it's like, you know, I think that it, something happens and the response is that. So sad. <laughs> and the the text prompt at the top of the meme said, me when the barista says the drip tastes like peaches and brown sugar, but I just taste six hour old drip. Dude, oh, we snap. were just talking about this. <laughs> oh, snap. And I thought that was funny. And ain't it true about oh, drip? True. And I, how do you make it better? And I think there might be a solution. I've been meaning to talk to you boys about this. I kind of already did. But Scott Rao. I'm familiar. Rao. Thank you. Uh, he, on his website, I don't know if it's his product or not, he's selling a basket you put in your Curtis that turns it into a one liter brew brewer basket. Mm, I see. And I'm like, is that the answer? Brew Just smaller batches. Yeah. In the afternoon. Specifically. More bed depth. Yeah. Uh, and maybe it is because I, I am sure that it brews better coffee regardless. If you dial in that recipe on the smaller yeah. situation. Um, but especially in the afternoons, you know, there's just a cutoff of, okay, it is 1130 from now on. We're going to brew one liter batches. How many ounces is one liter? Anybody know? I'm going to go on a whim and say like 34 because it's similar to a quart, which is 32, but it's a little more. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
So it's it's bigger than a or smaller than a half batch. That's right. That's really small. Jeez. Yeah. Well, I think you'd probably maybe probably maybe make a recipe where your yield is around a liter. Well, you know what, boys? What? We have a brewer that brews liter batches. It's called a Curtis Seraphim. Too bad that product is not doing too well for us. Mm. Oh. But you know how it ha- you can slide the basket in? Yeah, yeah, It's yeah. like perfect yep. for that. That's a, that's a really good point. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. Do you think the tone could do something similar? I don't think any of our pour over equipment can do anything. <laughs> that just happened. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a little I, foretaste into I, uh, what we'll be talking about later. <laughs> it's no, fun. I just I don't want to poke the beast, man. We've got him in a pretty good spot right now. I can't go changing anything, or, or else it's gonna bite, like you know clap back. Hey, well, as we get into this glorious episode, we'll be discussing chapter twelve of unreasonable hospitality we're really getting into it probably over halfway huh check that out uh and we're gonna talk about guys we've made mistakes oh some serious mistakes everybody makes mistakes and we want to talk about potentially our three biggest mistakes we've ever made within this company yep uh so without further ado ethan you i think you had something you wanted to discuss well, I just wanted to keep everybody updated. You know, I sprained my ankle. Yeah, uh, he did. Last Saturday, did the pod on Monday with Riley. You got to show it off over there. Um, did you do a zoom in on the edit? Do you want me to say yes to make you feel better? Sure. Yes. Y- yes. Oh, thanks. Um, I just needed to own up to something. It was healing really well, and I thought that I could go to frisbee the next saturday Mm. so i got a nice ankle brace so dumb and i didn't wear cleats and i was like i'll just go jog around to stay warm you know i don't want to don't want to get out of my top frisbee shape of course i mean this physique doesn't happen overnight no you got to work for it it takes tender love and care and so i go out there and i jog around for three minutes and i roll my ankle jogging in a straight line i say all right well that was that was nice and then i went home and iced it all day and i just needed to tell you guys that so no one can feel bad for any for me anymore because you know like everybody was spraining your ankle playing ultimate frisbee is already kind of silly but i think i had you know just built i was being such a sad puppy about it people felt bad for a little bit and then i just did it again and they're like we can't feel bad for you anymore. Yeah. You just have to, you're going to have to operate like a normal person now. Mm. What did Meredith say when she, when you told her that? Funny enough, she was kind of the most like on my side because she saw the progression every yeah. day. She saw me mm. moving around, mm. getting better. And I was like, I think I can, can you just go like walk around, you know, jog around? She was like, oh, okay. And then, you know, she wakes up Saturday morning and I'm already on the couch with the leg propped up in the ice bag. And I'm like, Honey, it didn't go well. She's like, I was frisbee. I was like, well, <laughs> been here for two hours. So, yeah, but guys, I just had to tell everybody. And I'm sorry, everybody. I didn't steward my ankle well. We need you in tip top. Shane. I know. I know. When are we going to wrestle? You know, we, we got a wrestle match. We have coming wrestling up. to do. We have running to do. Footballs to throw. Frisbees to throw. We got push ups. Push up, push up 30s coming around the corner. Whoa. Come on. So, that's it. You know, so if you see me wincing over here, it's just, I'm just processing. Anyways, what a great transition. Yeah, that was seamless. Seamless. Hey, if you're enjoying <laughs> the great content we're pushing out so far, make sure to smash like, subscribe, review this podcast, and follow us. Do you see reviews? Uh, on Apple, yes. On Spotify, No. I mean, you just see like what your overall rating is on Spotify. I think think we're like 4.8, 4.9 on 60 reviews on Spotify. Dude, I want to see the bad reviews. That's funny. That would be funny. Because like we care so much about our cafes. You know, it's a very big, to us, it's a big thing, multiple people. But this is just like us talking. Yeah. Yeah. So who's out there being like, this is boring. Yeah. 
And I'd be like, I don't know. I'd be like, touche. <laughs> touche. <laughs> touche. My dad said he can't uh he can't review on Google Podcast, but he oh. gave me a five star review. Google's so behind in everything they do, man. You know, like their phones. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to the I got little tech corner. I got a new Google Pixel. I can't even open my camera. Dude, it, let's be let's be fair here. You bought a two hundred dollar new phone. There was a discount. All right, it was like four fifty. And Is, you you bought like their cheap phone model from two three years ago. Oh, okay. I, I'm not I'm not trying to I'm not trying to ruffle Is your Google feathers. Is Google paying you? I'm just saying. I'm I think if you went out and you bought like a Pixel Eight Pro or whatever they've got right now, that phone would work incredible. Because I had a Google Pixel Three. Sure. Uh, whatever. XL or something. And that phone was awesome. Extra large. I liked it. But then uh, I had to have those blue bubbles. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm pretty hated in most communities because of my Android. And I'm sorry, but it kind of goes with my angle. personality, you know? Oh. <laughs> gritty. <laughs> my angle. Yeah, I'm gritty. You're so gritty. <laughs> Anyways, smash like. <laughs> and thanks for the five-star review, Dad. <laughs> I received that. Thank you, Randy. Guys, this chapter, chapter 12, kind of the empathy to the excellence of the former chapter. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, mm. I've heard it said. Relationships are simple. Simple is hard. Uh huh. You have this, this idea. Let's be the best restaurant in the world. Let, for us, let's be the best coffee shop in the world. The vehicle for having that accomplished is through people. Yeah. The largest obstacle for having that mission accomplished? People. Thank you. It's tough. Yeah. People are, it's tough. Humans. This is kind of the human chapter. Yep. What'd you guys, what'd you guys get? There's a few things that stuck out to me. One, uh, he, he was talking about how people who are really good at hospitality are often unique, eccentric, sensitive yeah. people. Yep. Um, and it's because people that are really good at hospitality are highly empathetic and tuned to what other people are feeling. They're empaths. Oh. Um, and with that, it, you know, it, it, he also says, uh, he, he's quoting somebody else, but he says one size fits one, not one size fits all. Um, and that is really the heart of empathy. I also loved how uh, in empathy, it's it's not just about being nice and sweet to everybody. It's about uh, adjusting the, your approach to someone based off of how they're wired. So he talks about how some people, when he criticizes them or calls them higher, you know, you've got to like dissect everything you say and super plan it out and plan to hang out with them afterwards just to like make them feel confident and comfortable. Whereas some people need to be yelled at in order to get through to them. And those two people are totally different. Mm -hmm. um, but you want the intended outcome to be the same, which is that they grow. So uh, one size fits one. I thought that was really impactful. What about you guys? Good question. Thanks. Um, Go ahead. He starts, you know, he's talking about the team later, but uh, in the beginning, he's talking about his relationship with Daniel, the mm -hmm. his partner in crime. Um, the chef. Chef. Yes, he's talking chef. And they're talking about, you know, coming up with the third option. You know, Daniel wants something. Oh, or yeah. feels impassioned about something. Will is impassioned about something. And they have to kind of push that friction together and birth mm. the third option. Yep. So there's a few layers to that. It's like one is being okay, pushing each other, right? Yep. Pushing those passions together and seeing what pops out. Um, and then also he talks about conceding to your partner. He says sometimes the only way to proceed in, a, in pursuit of a good partnership is to decide that whoever cares more about the issue can have their way. What are you guys thinking about? Why'd you look at me? <laughs> but do you feel like we operate in that field? Oh, yeah, for sure. That's just like, 
if someone's really about something, we're like, okay. Yeah. I think so. Uh, honestly, I rebuked myself when I read this because I kind of feel like the bulldozer of the group. I Well, I was thinking about our dynamics. And I was like, you are just kind of an impassioned individual. Whereas in, what are we? What are we chop liver? Chop liver. We're, we're over here like, yeah, oh, yeah. But I think that's where we've had to learn to to match you, you know, match your passion, match your drive, and like understand the deeper whys of why we make decisions. So it's been it's been really helpful for me. It's been a growing seven years of, you know, looking at situations and being like, what do I really care about? Because I think this does stand, but I think later he says, neither of us could abuse the it's important to me card. And so it's mm. like, I need to learn how to, when to pull that out. I'm trying to trying to think if there's any times you guys can think of that we did that. Well, that's the thing. It's like, you know, I think that we are all usually pretty aligned because of the values we've set in this business. For so sure. something we've been talking about lately was like, our quality not matching our standards for our company. And I brought that to you guys, just like thinking about that. But like, it didn't take me convincing you guys that we needed to start putting more focus on training or on quality or upgrading our equipment or so on and so forth. Because all we had to do was look at our value, that's uh, our values and our vision and see, oh, top 1% of coffee. Yep. Okay. Let's do this. Um, yeah, it, it becomes a lot less about like Riley wants this. Yeah. So much easier to get behind something that we've already all agreed to. Mm-hmm. For sure. But I mean, there's definitely always small things. Like I'm trying to think, we ran into this really often, just like in the midst of the build out in Dunwoody about, you know, specifics of something chrome or nickel plated this or yeah this kind of t- well it, we uh, probably argued about the tile for a long time yeah and we were in a lot of different places or more more just like the siding of the bar like what was that going to be for a long time yeah and i think because we kept pushing into each other it forced us to come up with better ideas yeah for and sure. that that was so fun just in retrospect of like that build out compared to the first one everything was so personal in the first one because it was our first cafe Mm -hmm. and there's a there's something in you that wants to make you say it's your cafe not our cafe so it's like i gotta have this thing that's like that was my idea but what's so cool about dunwoody is like people ask me multiple times they're like so what did you what did you contribute like what was your ideas you know i was like yeah i don't know i mean we just this this was our idea yeah everybody kind of had a thing like we'd start with maybe we did a slat wall what if it was like this maybe we should do lights here what about these ah what about these and everything just kind of would get refined by each other because it wasn't like here's my golden idea don't touch it just say yes or no but it's it's that uh the invitation to collaboration wow yeah i definitely when you were first talking about that i don't remember even from the first cafe I don't remember what was and wasn't like my mm-hmm. ideas, but especially on this one, that that goes into what he was saying of like the third option. Yeah, and I think we do that a good bit. We we take the third option because you have an angle that's completely different than my angle. Same for you. We talk about it and then we develop something that works with all of that, and it's better. It's a better idea, for sure. Um, something I really loved in this, he, he talks about when it comes to like leading a team, the t- one of the two main areas of communication is praise and criticism. He says praise is affirmation, but criticism is investment. Um, and I feel like so often we put a negative stigma on criticism as like we're tearing someone down, but the fact that we're willing to invest in them enough to correct and build up rather it's so a good good mindset shift for me. Um, and right under that, he talks about how leaders have to be open to criticism as well. Yeah. That I feel like that's something I have to like remind myself of very frequently because it's just so easy to kind of that default, you know, what we were saying or I was saying about like 
thinking this is my company or my cafe. There's also a default of like, I'm above criticism because I'm the guy. But he says, if you always push back or insist on justifying your mistakes, people are eventually going to stop coming to you with notes. You've made it too unpleasant for them to continue. They're going to stop investing in you and you're going to stop growing as a result. Um, that's big. That's, that's big. That's big. So I'm always, um, it's cool when I can think about recently getting like criticized or rebuked or brought to something. Cause I'm like, okay, people can still bring stuff to me and I can still grow. I made a big mistake yesterday, you know, and we were able to talk about it with the team, you know, and get it all figured out. But if like the owner makes a big mistake and nobody feels like they can tell him that he did that, it's like something, something's amiss. Absolutely. Anything else in this chapter? I mean, we have to talk about it. Talked about yelling at employees. Oh, yeah. We have a whole podcast episode about that. We do, with Dan Campbell as the thumbnail. Yeah. It it makes you think, you know? Uh, And I understand his side. And I specifically think about, like, what if we had someone who was an athlete their whole life and that was their form of communication that they received and were used to? Yeah. But I feel like so much of the time, you just have to tread so lightly there because... You know, who was likely to yell at this person? Like, you know, let's call it a parent who they have a strained relationship with. Mm -hmm. Sure. So navigating that, it's in a way, it's just like almost, it's almost just like so hard to navigate it that like, is it even worth it? Mm. Um, But I don't know. I can think of one time where I've yelled. And it was, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll just say it. I think you were here. Maybe you didn't receive it as yelling. But uh, Dale and Sam and you were in there probably packaging coffee and you guys were playing music too loud. Mm -hmm. And I had like just asked like that morning for music not to get played too loud. Mm -hmm. And then I was in the front room like watering the plants and one of the neighbors came over like pissed off at me for it. And so I just went back there and I I just let loose. Did he yell? Uh, Well, the... I don't remember, but I remember the intensity, which is why I think it was it was constructive. But yeah, exactly. I don't I, a neighbor. I don't think has ever come back. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's why you know in that podcast episode we talked about NFL coaches yelling after the players. It the intensity matters whenever you're trying to communicate something, mm-hmm. and for some people. All you have to do is say, hey, let's go talk in the office. That's all the intensity they need. And they're like melting yeah. at just the thought of that, which is what he says. you know. Whereas some people are more thick-skinned and hard-headed and they, everybody needs to understand the severity of what's going on. It's just that people understand that in different ways. And I loved how he, he said when he was yelling, it wasn't emotional. Because when you're emotional, You say things you don't mean or you say it in the wrong way. Um, He said everything, all of of his words as he was talking at a raised tone were calculated and thought out still. Um, But they were just more. It's it's a real stoic mindset, which is awesome. Like even in his yelling, he was practicing that stoicism of like, this is a controlled, calculated, you know, pursuit I'm doing right now. Mm-hmm. Just because, it, and it's empathetic towards this guy that needs to hear it this way, but I could immediately switch that off and go talk to a, another employee that is is more sensitive and uh, can't receive feedback in that way. So, yeah, he says you absolutely cannot lose control and rage. Uh, I often this is a nuanced subject, but I remember uh, a parent talking about spanking. Mm-hmm. They're like. We do spank our children, but we will never do it when we're motivated by anger. Right. So it's like, yes, you can do this thing. I guess you can step into this, but here are the parameters. It's like, yes, you can raise your tone with your team, but do so under these parameters. I can't wait to cut that into a reel. (laughs) Just me saying spanking over and over again? Yeah. You're just trying to be effective. Yeah. You're trying to get a, a result. Yeah, and uh, that you get to that result in different ways, but t- depending on who you're talking to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But that's different than uh, maybe what a a normal hot headed boss would do, where they just they you just never know when they're gonna pop off and like on anyone, and that's there's no empathy in that. Mm. Good stuff. Hey, we promised, and we're here to deliver. Discount code for Kenya, fifty percent off. Let's go. A <gasps> box of Kenya Nairi Hill Estate. Are you sure, Riley? I'm 50, sure. I'm 50%? sure. Fifty percent. I'm sure. Use code Sweet Potato Pie. Sweet Potato Pie. That's one of the notes. All one word, all lowercase. Yeah, or uppercase. I think it works either way, but one word for sure. It's not case sensitive. Oh, Sweet Potato Pie for fifty percent off your restrictions box of Kenya. may apply. Well, boys, it's time that we did some reflection on our last seven years of doing business together. God, I hate reflecting. <laughs> Well, get ready because it's like about re- to get. I like refracting. It's going to be really reflective in here and reflexive, uh, contemplative. I th- I we had this idea this morning to talk about our top three worst it mistakes. Wasn't this morning, this has been planned for weeks. Oh, this yeah. was in the show. No, notes. I, I didn't say that. Okay, yeah. I'll edit that part out. This right, morning last year. Now yeah. we this we were so convicted about this topic. Yeah, that out of all we the ones totally. Th- we just scooted back all of our other Scoot topics. Back. Scoot it back. Canceled our interviews. <laughs> uh, top three mistakes we've ever made. Why would we talk about mistakes? Man, some people call them mistakes. I call them happy accidents. <laughs> Bob Ross. Um, but mistakes, man. Bob Ross Walters. They really do be the best way to learn. Ugh. Because when you got a when you got a scar from when you effed up, then you look back at that scar and you're like, man, let's not do that again. It's kind of just how I look at this whole company. Yeah, this is my, this, these friendships, everything. I'm um, just kidding. You guys, I love you so much. I didn't mean that. We love you, man. Sure. Anyways, um, but the, those are the most poignant of, mm-hmm. of learning lessons are the ones that got a little bite to them and cost you dollars and cost you time, and cost you headache and you're a fool if you think that you're not gonna make a mistake when you start your company yeah and i think uh another thing with mistakes is that when you make them then don't beat yourself up you know and don't beat up the people around you even if it's their fault because the only helpful thing to do is like okay what's the next best move Mm -hmm. in light of that Mm -hmm. and how can we make that never happen again because when you make mistakes it shows you that you've got blind spots and it shows you that because you never intentionally make a mistake. So it's because you have a blind spot or you don't have experience or so they're incredibly valuable. And I think reflecting on them today would do us some good in our listeners. Um, worst one. Well, maybe we'll go in chronological order order of, of, uh, Orner Orner. Wait, Ross, what's Orner? <laughs> I'm joking, man. Come uh, on. Chronological we- order. Uh, order. When we first started. So oh, man. we, many of you know out there in the metaverse, we started as a cart, a mobile espresso bar. And we our started ho- as three kids with an idea. Our whole idea. Take, wa- a step, take a step back. Okay. Three kids with an idea. Okay, so we were three kids with an idea. Good job, guys. That's good. Three Radio. kids with a dream. Do it again. Roll it back. <laughs> um, I think our idea was a great idea. We were just very immature in how we thought we would execute it. So the idea was that we're going to have a daily pop-up at this really cool, the coolest place. What's the coolest place? In the world. Citizen Supply. Pont City Market, baby. Let's go. At the time... We thought that was like cream of the crop, where the who's who of anyone. Sure, there's coffee shops in Pond City Market already. We who just cares? Th- what were all of the things we didn't think through? Man, we didn't think through of like, we probably didn't even know what a non-compete was at that point. Because like, like, capitalism. Yeah, like let's just open a, a coffee shop right next to another one. Didn't know anyone there or ask them. Zero we connection. Had hey, this idea. My, my wife's okay. um, small group leaders husband was one of the owners well, okay. okay i mean the connection is uncanny. that's strong that's really strong i mean so you're saying there's a chance <laughs> <laughs> i've never met him but um but our whole thing was like when when we were i remember sitting down with a family member 
asking them for money for our Kickstarter. Money, and please. I remember, <laughs> I remember uh, telling her, uh, we're, so we're going to have a pop-up in this cool place called Citizen Supply. And she's like, oh, that's great. Like, have you talked to them yet? And I was like, well, no. <laughs> We haven't talked to them yet. We need the money first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's cringe, cringe level. It's so cringe. But I very vividly remember that moment, and it taught me a valuable lesson that in order to start anything, you have to do some due diligence first mm. to see if it's even possible. Yeah. But I did love the mentality we had at that time, even though it was raw and it was it was amorphous. We had that puppy in us. It was like, we are going to do this thing, and nobody's going to stop us. Listen, not only that, there was another one, too. What? Is that we were going to be a coffee caterer at the Georgia World Congress Center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we put some time into that one. Yeah. Let, okay, well, we had a little bit more of a connection there, but... Yeah, and let's spell out the mistake. We, want, we thought we were going to do this. Like We were like, this is how our company's going to work. We start the company... And it doesn't work. I remember walking up to the counter at Citizen Supply one time when I was there, and some, you know, rando was behind the the counter, and I was like, "Hey, is there like a manager around I could talk to, or you know, like, how, how do I become a vendor here?" And I think they gave me some email, and we emailed the email. And I don't even. I think I think we got a response. I I can't remember how it shook out. But I, it was, I literally think the response was like, uh. So and so has a non compete. That yeah. was the response, right? Uh, yeah. So I mean, it was like it could have happened. Yeah, it could have happened, but it just didn't. Yeah. So whenever you're making a decision, and in this case, a wrong decision, it means that you're prioritizing something that you shouldn't be prioritizing, or you don't have experience, or or how how would you diagnose this error in a way that we could learn from it, and our listeners could. I think you said it best, dude. Lack of due diligence. It's, and I think that came from fear of cold, yep. cold calling and just like asking before we had the concept. Cause we yep. like, we waited until we had the concept. Right. We were like, so maybe the heart was good there in that, you know, we're going to wait until we have this so that they can see how cool it is. And we just shouldn't have, you know, we, we should have just gotten in, out in front of it. And I, I still feel that in some ways. Like I um, agree. Yeah. You know, you, you want to have like the refined thing because like, you know, you're kind of told you're supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking last week about debt and like SBA loans. Like you have to have two years of proof mm -hmm. to get a loan. Um, so I think we just kind of framed other things in our business like that. Yep. Or I think about whenever we, used to send samples to people before we know how to, knew how to roast great coffee and when our packaging wasn't what it is now. Um, at a certain point, I think it was a good idea. We stopped sending samples of like our old packaging until we got our new stuff. But I don't know. That's kind of the same, same vibe. Uh, but now I, I'm just like, I don't know. Maybe it's just extra confidence that I'm not really afraid to ask something like if we want to do like a brand partnership with someone you know we don't have to like present them with this glorious thing it's like we're people they're people we're both trying to do something cool and maybe make some money so yeah yeah second worst mistake we've ever made go <laughs> I just didn't know what order we were going sure, in. Sure, sure. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. When we've talked about this a little bit, um, but when we were building out our cafe, we had to buy a lot of equipment and we bought the cheapest of the cheap equipment. And one would think that that is just what you got to do. And that is partly what you got to do. Um, but honestly, if I think about like how much we had to budget and like, let's just say a refrigerator to go from crappy to great is an extra like $800. I'm like, 
I bet we could have scrounged up the money. Yeah. So a huge mistake. I would have put two fifty out of my own pocket just to just to get past get the headache away. Me driving into from my house just to go like defrost a refrigerator and try to see if I can get it working. Oh, that's a good point. The, You're the doing one. it, so actually I don't care. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'll put two fifty in. Yeah, so we we really under invested in like the non coffee area of equipment in our cafes, and we definitely paid the price for it through constant headaches, way extra costs, um, a burden to the team. And something that brought this to mind, I think why uh, it's fun to talk about, was we finally retired the one of the first pieces of equipment we ever bought for this company uh, from the cafe, which was a single bay under-counter refrigerator that we got for $50. $50. $50. They oh, typically yeah. run... Fifteen hundred dollars. Yep. Shout out to Blake Hall for helping Ross uh, uh, yeah. wrestle that thing into the. Where'd you put it in the escape? Yeah. Good on you. Yeah. Nice. Good on you. It, it lived in your mom's garage for a little while. Rent free. Oh yeah. Do you guys yeah. remember when the espresso machine lived in my garage for a long time? Yes. Long time. Yeah. Oh yeah. Months. Yeah. Th- this is sort of a, uh, a a balancing idea to what you're saying, Ethan. It's something we've talked about on this program before. Sorry, program um, is you. just get open. Yeah, like if if you uh, need your operation to be really skinny in order to get open, and you're you're pretty broke, and you kind of can't afford to wait, like just get open, start making money, mm-hmm. and and I guess the takeaway, even holding that idea in in tandem with what you're saying is prioritize replacing the equipment and upgrading the equipment before you have to Mm. because the day is going to come either way but you can either choose to upgrade it before it's time or it will choose for you Mm -hmm. when it's time at an inconvenient time it will only happen when it's inconvenient that oh yeah we just lost the three bay fridge too because we send our old stuff to the roastery because it's a lot less utilized Yep, but yeah, we. Now, not only do you send it, you uh, you trade it out. I trade it. Yeah. No, I didn't trade the three bay. You didn't trade the three bay. You traded the single bay. And the single bay is even better here because there's more space for oat milk. Yeah, that's so so you're, great. You're welcome. And Zion fixed the door permanently. Yeah, he was able to fit a screw through the hinge. There you go. So now it works a lot better. Good on you. I said, good on you, Zach. Thanks, Z. Thanks, Z. Yeah, so upgrading equipment, but if you can just like, may, ugh, man, I, I would even say like if you're if you're gonna get a thirty thousand dollar espresso machine, get a fifteen thousand dollar espresso machine if it means everything else is like really reliable. Dude, I, I would stand by that. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. Un- unless it's gonna super mess with your workflow or something you really value, but I mean, we would, we this. would just have bare bare minimums for espresso machines, and I think that would be a linea with volumetrics. Yeah, yeah. Back to like, what are you prioritizing? That's how you make decisions: is align priorities. Like, we're gonna prioritize the espresso machine, and that means we're gonna have a headache later, but we're okay with that because we want this espresso machine. Or you, you could prioritize just like. We want this cafe to function as it should, ideally, in all categories. You know, it's all just holding it in tension and doing cost benefit analysis on it. But I think we skimped a little too much there. Oops. And we've paid the price over time. Mm. Yeah. I mean, we were talking about it earlier. Like, we, part of the reason we went with the Seraphim is because it was cheaper than the Mod Bar pour over a unit and kind of have some regrets yep i mean without having experience experience with the mod bar right unit. just assuming based off of the quality of the other mod bar stuff uh we're kind of disappointed and or you can look at the tone at the alpharetta cafe which has been pretty solid but not without its flaws and not without having to get what two new units or something. Gosh. So, 
Uh, it was basically completely broken when it arrived. Yeah. And, but so we had to get replaced entirely. Yeah. So, you know, with that stuff, if we would have just started from the more expensive place. Yeah. If we're talking about learning lessons, ask around. There's a lot of coffee shops and a lot mm. of restaurants that have a lot of equipment. That's yeah. true. You know, it wasn't until this morning that you decided that we, you, you made a proactive move to, move to ask someone about the piece of equipment that we have yeah and shout out to us being able to talk about it and people send us resources like charles norman of bellwood coffee hit me up with like a like a mod for the clump crusher on the e80 our Mm -hmm. espresso grinder how's it been um i guess great i did it i cleaned it out and set it up on wednesday so it's been about six days so i'm gonna go take it apart and check it out then or when i get to the cafe today report back yeah i'll report back made a little special one-off episode just me talking about the grinder yeah and david from circle coffee sent me a uh tool that makes it easier to take the top piece off we've done it so much that i think we've really weakened it from being hard to take apart but a company makes a specific like wrench to take this apart and i'm just like how dumb is that that they made a product so hard to take apart when you're supposed to clean it daily according to them Mm -hmm. that you have to buy another piece to open it it's tough it's tough but how great is the coffee community that we're all helping each other out so thank you david thank you charles thank you circle coffee thank you bellwood coffee that's right uh Third mistake, and we definitely want to be delicate with this one because we are going to get into talking about personnel and past personnel, and we want to be respectful. Um, But I think one thing that we did that really jumped the gun for us and was totally a reflection of our fault um, Mm -hmm. was early on, as in like before we even had a roastery or anything of this sort, we'd really put the cart before the horse and we hired someone to handle wholesale sales. Um, And they're a great person. I'm sure they're going to go on to do great things. But because of our ignorance in several areas, we had to hire someone and then eventually let them go. And that was, I would say, one of the hardest things we've ever had to do. Uh, So it, yeah, I don't know. You guys have anything? Yeah, well, it's just, it's one thing, you know, the first mistake we talked about was just us starting, and it's like us reaping the bitter fruit of our poor planning, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. The next one is like us reaping the bitter fruit of buying cheap equipment and the team having to, like, deal with it. It's like, oh, that that's worse. And then this was, like, even more so, uh, so detrimental to a person, so... The further down you go down the business trail and the more people you bring along the way, the more costly your mistakes get. And there's, I mean, I would say it's a good pressure, but I think it's a sobering pressure of like, you know, the decisions we make, the investments we make, the the risks we take, it all uh, revolves around people. And I remember w- when we first like hired people for the cafe, I was like, um, people are paying their bills with mm-hmm. the this idea that we had of a coffee company. Yeah. Mm-hmm. People are like raising children, getting married, moving out, doing all this stuff just based on the fact that they're hoping on like consistent income from our coffee shop. Yeah. Sobering. It's very and it, at the same time it's touching our like one of our biggest passions of why we did a business, which is like to give people awesome careers. So I think that's definitely, you know, our biggest mistake that we agree on is like the fact that we weren't able to give someone a career when we really wanted to and yeah. thought that we could. And so if anybody's in wholesale, they know how like difficult of a market that is. And we're a young roaster. We had it like rebranded. We didn't have a roastery like you were saying. But I think we were relying on, um, I think it'd be good to get into this, especially as a learning lesson of like, you're an owner of a business. You're good at a lot of stuff, but you're also not good at a lot of stuff. We knew that 
we weren't highly skilled as sales people, right? So I was like, okay, this would be a good idea to like offload. But to like start a new program and not A, be all in and then C, like, have someone run it, you got to have probably a lot of capital on your back end to like float their bill for a long time. But a coffee company that's got one cafe, three owners, a roastery inbound, we didn't have that at all. Yeah. So I think about like uh, my little brother, Colson. Colson. <laughs> Shout out, buddy. We see you. You are seen. Um, he sells like car chart, like it, he works for an energy, like oil company that's like getting into a new division, selling like solar panels and car chargers and stuff. Colson would work for big oil. Yeah. So he's, he's a pawn for big oil, right? <laughs> Let's just stop right there. I'm kidding. So, but he's in like a new sales division and it's like his whole thing is not commission because it's like a new program. Mm. Good point. And he's got like year. I think he's got like years of traction. How much does Colson make a year? So he's making like <laughs> just kidding. Beep, boop, beep, beep, beep. Uh, How much yeah. money does he have? Colson, comment below. He commented I mean, last episode that he just bought a house. So I mean, can't be doing too bad, buddy. Yeah, it was in Delonica. So, you know, a little more affordable. <laughs> and the more north you go in, in this area, um, but yeah. So it's like new program, new traction. You can't just run off commission. But we didn't have that backing capital for a new program and also he probably has people like look to to help him learn how to s sell stuff whereas in we're the furthest thing from salesmen you can get yeah over here yeah it was definitely a again and th that is why it was such a mistake on our part it was it was a we were putting this person on an island of you know go do this yep but then we didn't have the money to support it so to that person, I would say, I'm sorry that we did that. And like you said, it's something I think about often that like we were giving someone, like we were how someone paid their bills and we mm -hmm. failed on that side of things. And think about how underdeveloped the, the wholesale program was at that point. Yeah. We were still figuring out what the H we wanted to do Ooh. with wholesale. Did we just want to sell people coffee? Did we want to have this really huge perk program with a bunch of free consulting? It was so there, there was no direction and it was like, go sell. And then that's when COVID happened. And then it was like, okay, let's downsize. And then it just never, we, we never revisited and strengthened that program. So taking full responsibility there. I think another lesson too is, and this is not, not, not necessarily just with this particular situation we're talking about, but in hiring and in finding talent, not to fall in love with the person ever. Mm -hmm. And no matter how great their personality is, no matter how much you connect with them personally, no matter how easy to talk to they are, no matter how much they make you laugh, no matter how much you have in common, none of that really matters like when you're talking about dollars. All that stuff helps, but it's not a foundation. Foundations are more like skills and temperament and like procl proclivity towards certain like mindsets and, and just uh, different temperaments, you know, like you don't just want to hire somebody. You, if you only just hire off of gut and off of people you vibe with, then you will end up as we did in this situation, um, which is maybe one of the reasons they say don't hire your friends. Not that we were the great friends with this person, but um, one maybe one of those reasons that you shouldn't hire your friends is because you like your friends and you want them around you, but that doesn't make mean that they're going to be good at their job, not because they don't have a good work ethic, but because they might not be a good fit for that job. So I feel like that is, even when I'm interviewing someone and I'm really starting to, hit it off with them. I enjoy their presence. You know, they're fun to talk to. I have to always remind myself like, okay, that is simply a data point. It is mm -hmm. not, it does not need to cloud my perspective at all about this person. Um, especially for hiring, uh, uh, a new role that we knew nothing about yeah. at that point, you know, it's just, um, 
which has, it, that alone has taught us so much about creating standard operating procedures for people. And I think what you're saying, and I don't want to diminish it by any means, but like maybe a step above, like, you know, if talking about dollars, it's just like talking about what's best for the company. And that's what you have to do because you can talk about being a people centric company and all this stuff. But if you, what's best for the company, I think it was it this book that says it said it towards the beginning is like, what's best for the company is what's best for the people in almost yeah. all circumstances when you're yeah. a values driven company. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we kept sinking money into a salary that we couldn't afford, we go out of business and then everybody can't pay their bills. Mm -hmm. So, and then now it's like when we create positions, we create them, we create roles. We don't create roles for someone. We create roles for the company because it is true. It's just like, who's the most likely to be here in 10 years? The three of us in this room. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can try to have the same positions everywhere that could potentially be filled by other people. I hope the people we have are still here in 10 years. Like that's the desire and the desire is to grow this company, to give them even more elevated roles and better lives as time goes on. Mm -hmm. <sighs> it's yeah. tough, man. Yeah. I think something I've been learning the last year and this is a reflection of that is that not only all of that, but also we have to make the decision for that person sometimes too of like, I know that you're applying for this job, but like, do you, is this a good fit for you? Yeah. Like, do, are you going to, I know everybody applying for the job is like, yes, this is what I want to be doing. But it's like, no one knows what it's like to work the job if they haven't worked there yet. We know exactly what it's like and how people thrive in that. And that's a really tough decision to make of like, we're vibing. This is great. I love being around you. But like, I know that, say we're talking about hiring someone in the cafe. I know that just from what we talked, you got to be off on the weekends all the time. You travel all the time. Um, you like are really sensitive to high volume stress mm -hmm. and like you don't take well to people being kind of sharp with you. But it's like in this one-on-one -on -one moment, this is amazing. It's like, hey, I got to think ahead here and I don't think plugging you into this role, I think you're going to be miserable. Mm -hmm. You know, and over the years we've seen people that we really enjoy and love not shine in the roles that we've put them in because we're just prioritizing how much we like them, not how much they're going to thrive in this position, you know? So you can think about that is what's best for the company. That's also what's best for them. Mm -hmm. Cause like that friction and that incongruency sucks for everybody. It's just hard when, as the person putting them in that situation, sometimes we have to kind of make that decision for them. Um, and I used to just think that anyone awesome should just work at Valor and we'll make it work. Right. But like so people have dreams and the whole 10 year thing is like we hire such amazing people. They're just getting poached to go do other awesome stuff or they have like another dream that's more important to them than working at a coffee shop. But if we can be this like beautiful season of their life where they learned a lot of skills, soft and hard skills, uh, and they like go on from that a couple years, a few years later, I'm like, that's awesome. Yeah. Because that was, I think, a mistake personally. This is a bonus mistake. And I've talked about before. It's just like the control. We just think that we're a good company if people stay. But I'm like, I think we're a good company if people go too. Like yeah. in, in the right time, in the right season, to the right place. We're a good company if people are like, maturing past us and going on to something else. Um, and I think because we work in the industry that we do, we got to get comfortable with that and we can't like run away from that fact, but we have to embrace it and ha like walk with people in their season and let them go when it's time. Mm -hmm. And for the few, the few, the proud that remain and stay with us, like make sure that they fit the role that's best for them and the company. Not just like, oh, you're still here. Well, we'll give you more stuff to do. Yep. And I, that's tough, dude. That's tough. That's very tough. I, I think about sort of two different ways to look at hiring for cafes. And I, I think it the answer lies in the middle, as usual. But uh, hiring a bunch of really 
awesome, maybe a little a little bit more on the cusp of something big that they're about to do. Um, I, I have several people in mind that we have that their their availability is maybe not as good, you know, schedule wise. They're a little bit less flexible, but we really value their presence and talent behind the bar. Um, and the the turnover is is worse. They, they have a, a shorter life here at Valor. Having a bunch of people like that, or having a bunch of like, r- you know, really young cats that are like really raw, and we're able to shape and coach and and make them into this professional. You know, then they maybe stay with us for longer, and they sort of learn who they are in part by working at Valor. And I think having both in the same place is where the magic is. And I think we've we've had seasons of emphasizing either one, but it's tough. It's I I, I truly believe we we haven't fallen into this trap too much, but we've talked about it before. But just because somebody's doing a good job at their current job doesn't mean they should be promoted towards doing a much of paperwork. <laughs> we were talking about this before before we press record uh, of if if you have someone who is diligent in their work and they're in the right role that doesn't necessarily mean that they need to be promoted to manager because they would then stop they would they would do the things they're gifted for less because they would be worrying about the deposit sheet and the schedule when they sh- should be shaking hands and kissing babies and s- pouring cappuccinos because that's what they're really good at. Pouring but swans. Pouring swans, sorry. Wreaths. But the problem is is you can't be a barista forever. So what are you going to do? Yeah. You know, and that is where this, this, this side of the type of person we hire comes in where somebody is incredibly talented at being a barista, but financially speaking, they can't do that. It doesn't make sense for them for more than three years. And so because we're a smaller company and really the only upward mobility at this point is just like be an assistant manager at a cafe and order the milk or, you know, be a a head coach at the cafe and, and you are, you're, you're flexing a skill set that is different than why you're doing so good right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, and that is partly why we want to grow this company bigger so that we can have roles that are more tailored to that type of person. But dude, even, even then, I don't feel that good about it. Like, <laughs> just being honest, like, I, don't, I feel kind of pessimistic about that. But in a, in a way that it's like I accept it and I level with it and this is how it is. Just in the sense that like we have a really talented barista and they're awesome at it. We can't really see them fitting in any other role, or at least as well as they do in this role. So that, what are we going to do? Just pay them more to be what they're all they already are? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe that makes sense. You know, we have we have a, a pit crew member that's just like lights out, but like we shouldn't stick them in an office and pay them a salary, even though that's the promotion they could technically get. You know, so do we just? double their hourly just to stay where they are you know it's it's interesting conversation or maybe they're just one of those people that needs to move on to another job you know Mm -hmm. oh the service industry yeah that's pretty much how the service industry or start yeah or start charging 10 bucks for a latte Mm -hmm. yeah then everybody can make 60k behind bar yeah our job is to find people that are very very talented and amazing and hardworking to work behind the bar and keep them for as long as we can and then promote the ones that have the correct skill set for the role that they will be entering. That's we can do that. That's tough though. Yes, it is, man. Yeah. And just to kind of wrap it up, it's mistakes are super real and it's kind of embarrassing. I remember, for a lot of those mistakes that we made, especially when more people around, you got to go like tell everybody about yeah. it. And there's an anecdote in the book about a guy getting caught drinking. He's like, all right, well, we'll fire you right now and you can walk out or 
you can come back tomorrow and tell everybody what you did and move on. So especially when it came to like letting go of someone because we botched a wholesale program, just got to go tell everybody what happened. Yeah. It's really humbling, really stinks, but definitely leaves a, a scar that uh, you're a little slower to make promises, a little slower to make these big moves. But um, I don't think we'd be close to where we are now if we hadn't have made the mistakes that we did and just gone for it, you know? Accepting responsibilities is a key ingredient in that learning process. Because imagine if we made all these mistakes and then we just chose to stuff that feeling or, you know, come like it, like if you make a mistake, yeah, hide it in in order to save face or so that I can feel better about myself or whatever, that would completely be leaving gains on the table, you know, from these mistakes. So accepting responsibility solidifies that learning process in your mind. And so you can use it going forward, which is what we're doing on this program right now. Yeah. (laughs) Up and onwards, gentlemen. Hey, that was fun. That went that went somewhere, didn't it? I had one last thing. What? I feel like we can also be like I'm sorry, I said like. Um we can play the card of we're young, dumb, and we didn't go to business school. Mm. But in a different facet, someone once told us you can only be innocent for so long. You know, we're running a business and we're responsible for people and so Yes, we can be like, well, we've never started a wholesale program before. What do you want us to do? Yeah. It's like... Big deal, bro. Big deal. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a, I, I've been saying this to myself a lot lately. There's a million reasons, but there's no excuses, mm-hmm. right? It's like, yeah, there's context for why we mess up. Mm-hmm. That doesn't justify it at all. Um, so if you're out there, a million reasons, no excuses. Yeah, and that, there's, there's no like hanging your head in that. There's no reason. The only reason to think in that way is so that you can analyze why did this happen and grow from it. Yeah. He said that was, that was one of the most memorable things somebody's told me, honestly, is he said, you can only be innocent for so long. You want to be blameless or you, or you want to be excellent or something like that. And it's like, yeah, I can't pull that young and dumb and inexperienced card ever again. Cause even if that is maybe true, it's becoming less and less true. I'm becoming older and smarter and more experienced. <laughs> Cut to but, us over here smarter, really. <laughs> okay. So you have have less of an excuse. Yeah. Um yeah. Good stuff, boys. Thanks for listening to us, guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks for the listen. <laughs> uh you know what to do. <laughs> yeah. Hey, don't forget about that uh that Kenya deal. Yeah, right? boy, we're not gonna say it again. You I'm gotta just find say it. that Kenya deal. Yeah. Uh, but if you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your friends. We want other people to hear us talk too. <laughs> Comment your biggest mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Comment the biggest mistake you've ever made. Someone's going to be like listening to this podcast. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right. Love you guys. Love you.